Hi, I'm Tim Ellis. Thanks for joining us for Laneway Live. Tonight's guest is a professor in the public understanding of psychology. He's appeared on Magic Magazine's cover and is a member of the Inner Magic Circle. He's also an expert in dreams, luck, and lying. Please welcome Richard Wiseman. <laughs> Greetings from the UK. Greetings from the Quirkology Room. Look at well, that. One of the Quirkology Rooms. We have two Quirkology Rooms. We have a, a greeny one and then we have a ready one. So, uh, yes, yeah, this is where it, where it all happens. This is, this is Quirkology Central. I feel very honoured to be, to be looking, to be peeping into that special room that I've seen so often. <laughs> Wow. But for those yeah. who don't know you, uh, I'll give, you, uh, give them a, a little bit of an introduction to you. So you uh, you originally while you were, I assume, while you were studying, you were a street performer. Well, you kind of, yeah, in, in the sense we did it for a few weeks and, and weren't very good. <laughs> so uh, I, I studied psychology um, and uh, I got into magic really young, as, as we all did, you know, when I saw an eight-year-old grandfather showing me a trick and all of this stuff. Um, and then I got into psychology and, and went to University College London, which is right in the middle of London. And then over the summer, uh, I, I teamed up with a friend of mine, who's now a very famous neuroscientist, and we realised we had no money, and so we should we should go street entertaining. How hard can it be? We thought. So we went down Covent Garden, which is the sort of main street entertaining place in London, and met uh, Duncan Trillo, who was was fantastic. Who now does uh, Magic Week and lots of other amazing things. And yeah, we had a, a, a two person juggling act, and we were terrible, and we had no money. And at the time, my girlfriend was a nutritionist. And I said to her, how can we eat with the smallest amount of money and still, still survive? She said, you eat porridge and with the grapefruit segments in, because the grapefruit segments mean you don't get scurvy. So that's what we survived on for, for two weeks. Uh, and we were terrible. But in that sense, yes, I did, I did start my working life as a, as a street entertainer, yes. And you've already given us a fantastic tip for quarantine. Absolutely. Porridge and grapefruit segments, apparently. You can keep going for weeks. Um, I think we did two weeks on it and then couldn't take any more. And, and so uh, I think we splashed out on a McDonald's burger or something. Uh, but um, yes, yeah, so, but the interesting thing is with street is that you realise that when people aren't interested, they just walk away. And, and, and of course, that doesn't happen in a normal theatre. So in a normal theatre, you can convince yourself that, that you know, the audience is having a great time because they haven't got that option. On the street, you learn the hard way of what works and what doesn't. So it was, actually, it was a good education. And has that given you your, uh, your theatrical flair for when you do your presentations? It, it gives me, I mean, I have a very short attention span anyway, but, but I, I do sort of think what, what is interesting at this moment, if the audience had the option to walk, would they? And how can, I, how can I get them back? So the whole thing of structuring it with promise and what's coming up, and I'll tell you about that later, and all these things, um, you know, that sort of basic storytelling stuff. Yeah, I, I think it has its roots probably there. So your policy is, is, seems to have been you'd rather make people think and discuss rather than just sit and listen to your lectures. Yeah, I, I think as much interaction as possible so it's, I mean, I, I, because I'm an academic, I go to a million lectures. I'm normally bored within seconds uh, of, of the person starting. Um, and I think, you know, how do you get over that? And I, and I think for me, it's about interaction. It's about giving them little experiments to do, little demonstrations, maybe some magic. How would you respond in this scenario? All that stuff, the magicians do so naturally. I mean, we break that fourth wall so quickly. You know, instantly it's like, will you help me out and, and, and everyone try this and, and so on. We know that stuff instinctually. But even from a normal performance point of view, it's not really what actors are taught. It's, it's a very different skill set. So I think magicians know far more than they realise in, in terms of how you really engage with an audience. It's interesting because a lot of magicians that I know of now are taking a very serious psychological approach to their art where they will sit down and they'll study it and they'll understand the psychology of the misdirection. They'll, they'll really, really go for the whole uh, academia of it. But others, and I'll include myself in this, are much more instinctual 
so I tend to do things. And then if people ask me, well, why did that work? Then I have to stop and think about it. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, I would look at the great kind of performers as, as it were, the people that have really pushed the art form forward. And for the most part, they haven't got a background in academic psychology and all this stuff that's coming out about uh, neuroscience and the brain and so on. To be honest, they're doing what you're doing. You know, they're, they're, they're using their instincts, but also they're performing a lot and they're trying stuff and they're finding out what works and what doesn't work. I mean, psychologically, it's a really complicated system. You know, humans are reasonably difficult to fool. They're all going to get together afterwards and talk about your performance. So you have to not only fool them right there and then, but a group of them afterwards. And as we all know, people are a bit unpredictable. And so it's, it's a messy old system. And I think you get good, like anything, by doing it lots and lots and lots. So I think it's good to think about stuff, but not to overthink stuff. I think my best ideas in terms of magic or quackology have just come from waking up in the morning and somehow my brain has put two and two together uh, and, and come up with something. I'm not saying it's ever come from sitting there and, and sort of working it all out from a book or something like that. Well, your first quirkology was the colour changing card. Hi, I'm Richard. This is Sarah. And we're going to perform the amazing colour changing card trick with this blue backed deck of cards. Now, the idea is very simple. I'm just going to spread the cards in front of Sarah and ask her to push any card towards the camera. Right, OK, let's see. I'm going to go for this card here. OK. Now, Sarah could have selected any card at all from the deck, but she selected the card which is now face down on the table. And what I'm going to ask her to do is show us which card she selected. Right, so the card that I chose was in fact the Three of Diamonds. The Three of Diamonds, OK, an excellent choice. That card goes back into the deck. Now I'm just going to spread the cards face up on the table. Give a little click of the fingers. And you'll see that Sarah's card here has now got a blue back. Not particularly surprising. What's slightly more surprising is all of the other cards have got red backs. And that is the amazing colour changing card trick. I'm Richard, this is Sarah, and we're going to perform the amazing colour changing card trick with this blue backed deck of cards. Now, the idea is very simple. I'm just going to spread the cards in front of Sarah and ask her to push any card towards the camera. Right, OK, let's see. I'm going to go for this card here. OK. Now, Sarah could have selected any card at all from the deck but she selected the card which is now face down on the table. And what I'm going to ask her to do is show us which card she selected. Right, so the card that I chose was in fact the Three of Diamonds. The Three of Diamonds, okay, an excellent choice. That card goes back into the deck. Now I'm just going to spread the cards face up on the table. Do a little click of the fingers and you'll see that Sarah's card here has now got a blue back. Not particularly surprising, what's slightly more surprising is all of the other cards have got red backs. And that is the amazing colour changing card trick. That really created quite a storm because it was at the very, very start of YouTube. So how did that come about? It, YouTube came out, um, I think Marco Tempest had done some, some optical illusion stuff on it. And I wanted to do some magic -y stuff. And of course, the, I love magic. I love the cleverness of magic. But the problem is we can't tell people how clever magic is because you don't want to reveal stuff. We all know that ruins it fairly rapidly. And so I wanted to try and create a clip that kind of illustrated how wonderful magic was, but without giving away magic. And I had that in my head probably for six months walking around. And I thought of the first part of the card trick, which would be that you would miss the effect I loved the idea that you'd think you're watching one effect and you miss the effect. It doesn't happen very much in magic. So to spoil it for people, you think it's about the cards and you miss the fact that everything else changes. 
And then I wanted it to be inclusive. So they were going to come backstage and see it was how it was all done. And under those circumstances, I wanted them to focus on how the, the effect they missed the first time was done, which is all the color changes. And in doing so, miss the method to the first effect they did see, which is the deck switch on the, uh, the color change of the deck. So all these complicated thoughts were in my head for about six months. And then we had downtime in the lab for one afternoon. Uh, I said to people, this will take an hour to film when I got everyone together. We were there for three or four hours. The poor guy in the gorilla suit was furious by the end. Because um, the original clip, which they didn't, it wasn't right, the filming wasn't right, he's eating a banana. And every time we refilmed, he had to eat another banana. And so he feels sick, he's in this suit. It was old uh, lighting, so it was really hot. I keep messing up the script. Uh, it's going on for hours. Um, and then we put it out and it became a viral, one of the first sort of viral videos. I woke up, it's a quarter of a million views. And, and that started the channel. And, and where did the name Quirkology come from? It came from, I believe, um, so Freakonomics had come out, the book Freakonomics. And somebody said to me at a conference, you should do one on uh, psychology. And I said, if I did, I'd do it on quirky psychology. Oh, quirkology, in the same way as you get free economics. It's a chance conversation. And then it was in uh, LA. I went to the airport and in the back of um, a Dan Brown book, I was reading a Dan Brown book and the back page, I wrote down every chapter, like sitting, waiting for the plane. Uh, and then that, uh, I pitched it when I got back and it became quite a big book. And that page is framed upstairs uh, in the uh, thing because it's, it's the page that, that, that started the whole thing. So yeah, that's where it all comes from. So now you have a YouTube channel that's chock full of not just quirkology, but also uh, bets you'll always win. I think that's also been another book, a result in a book. I'm yeah, not... I mean, I love that stuff because it's stuff that we know that goes back to like Victorian times. Mm -hmm. And because you forget with the new generation of kids, they haven't seen that stuff. They haven't read those books. And a lot of them are, are kind of clever. And so, yeah, they're, they're actually the most popular videos on there. It turns out if you can get people to win money, they, they really like those videos. And there's also practical jokes, psychological tests, life hacks. Uh, and yeah. there's more and more quirkology. And I just want to show a clip of one of your uh, more intriguing quirkology the floating cork. People occasionally ask me, is it possible to take an object like a cork, concentrate on it and have it levitate? The answer is yes. All you need to do is focus your attention on the cork. And what you will find is that it continues to levitate. It's absolutely incredible and just goes to show the power of the human mind. People often ask me, is it possible to take an object like a cork, concentrate on it and have it levitate? The answer is yes. All you need to do is keep on focusing your attention on the cork and it will continue to levitate. It's absolutely incredible and just goes to show the power of the human mind. Uh, yes, one, one of my favourites, uh, in part because it's one of the quickest to film. Normally they take hours and hours um, Mr. Goodwill leaves the building uh, after about an hour and uh, everyone's fed up with me and I'm doing it all oh, just one more time. I think we can just get it a little bit tighter. Um, and the two that aren't like that, one is called Assumptions, which is uh, the, one of the most popular clips. And we nailed it in one take, which was, was great. Corkology, um, the, the levitating cork. Uh, I was walking to the gym and I had the idea, Penn and Teller had done something a little bit similar. Uh, but not yeah. quite the same. Walk into the gym. At uh, the gym, I thought, yeah, I could do that, we could do that, we could do that, that'd be the angle. I walked back, we filmed it, I think it was four or five takes, and it's in the bag. And what I love about it is it illustrates actually why magic works. You know, you make one assumption and you're completely screwed. And, and once you see it, you go, ah, oh, I can't believe it. So it was right in front of me. 
Um, so yeah, it's, it's a novel method. It doesn't expose anything magicians be upset about. So and it just sort of shows, you know, how many assumptions we're carrying around with us. Well, some of the others that you've got up there, you don't expose anything. You just create this amazing piece of magic and, and leave it to the viewers to try and figure out. And I want to show one, which is one of uh, the more intriguing ones called The Vanishing. For centuries, people have been fascinated by the concept of reflection. In the past, they've poured water into a cup, looked inside and been amazed to see their own image. Nowadays, we use something a little bit more sophisticated, a mirror. Now with a mirror, the reflections are completely reversed. But there's something even more amazing going on. If you take an object like a banana, you can cover it up and even though its reflection is always in sight, the banana completely vanishes. It just goes to show the power of mirrors. So The Vanishing, uh, filmed uh, in London, actually not, not filmed here. Um, so when I watch that clip, I, I still get the pain that I had when we were filming it. You are looking, I think my memory is right, over the end point of over a hundred takes. It was a nightmare. It was a nightmare because the coordination involved and we were using liquid, which is a really bad idea on it. And then the vanish of the banana, nightmare. Um, there, there's literally millimeters to make that thing work. And we just filmed it, watched it, filmed it, watched it. Um, and then ended up with that clip and it's a fun clip. And, and you spend, I don't know what the clip is, 30 seconds or whatever it is. Um, and you don't see the, the four or five hours of argument, break, let's have a coffee, let's try it again. No, you can still see the banana. Now you can see the method. No, the liquid didn't pour properly. Now I put liquid on the table. You've got to mop it up. But it's got onto the sheet. So now that's different to the one in the mirror. You know, so <laughs> just endless, endless. But yeah, that's, that's the vanishing. <laughs> wow. That, that story reminds me of, uh, I'm sure you saw Darren Brown with his, I'm going to toss this coin for heads 10 times in a row. Yes. <laughs> great, great idea. Yeah. Wow. It was incredible. That was, yeah. You've also done, I mean, your Quirkology series, I don't, I don't know if it's spun into it, but you ended up on a, the ITV show, the nightly show, I think it was called, uh, three years ago, doing, yeah. your, re recreating some of your Quirkology clips in a, a professional studio. Yeah, we, we've done that a few times. We did it on a uh, American show called The Bleeped Up Brain. Uh, Mind Games originally was going to do it uh, as well, and I passed on going to uh, America, and so someday uh, um, Apollo filmed that, uh, Apollo Robbins uh, filmed that. Um, and then over here we had the, the nightly show, and they wanted to do the clips, and it's just... So we film in SD, not HD, which means the quality is much lower, which for illusions is your friend. Uh, because there's all sorts of stuff, you know, focusing is different and so on. As soon as you make it in a professional setup and you have to light it properly, uh, if you're doing forced perspective, for example, it's a bit of a nightmare. So we, we struggled a bit, but yeah, they ended up on, on national television. And it is, it is the weirdest thing because, you know, I love the homeliness of Quirkology. The fact it is just filmed in the house and it's, it's you know, Caroline's dressed up as the ninja and, and so on. And then to sort of take that out and put it into a professional setting and then watch it on a big Saturday night TV show. You just go, that's all a bit weird. That's so, but it's nice. It's nice. And the interesting thing I find now is that Quirkology has really come into its own because now magicians, our gigs have disappeared. Our audiences have disappeared. We can communicate in this way yeah. through these little boxes, through this fixed lens camera, which has been your friend for so many years. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I, I was watching a feed that a magician was, uh, and they were doing some card tricks and then using a, a forced perspective method. And they were going, oh my goodness, I've just sort of invented it. I was thinking, we've been doing this for years because <laughs> this, this has been our medium. 
we've thought about this stuff and, uh, and, and so on. So yeah, I, I think a lot of the basic principles that we've, we've played with there would translate very well to if you're doing close-up magic because, you know, it is all different. You know, I, I, is, is you're just making assumptions all the time about how forward or backwards a, a something is and that allows you to mask something. So yeah, and it, here's actually a lot of fun because you can record it, watch it, and go, does that work? You know, you don't need to be out there walking around, you know, in doing walk around magic 20 times to find out it does or doesn't work. You can kind of do that on your own. So yeah, it, it fits the, the current situation very well. And we've all got plenty of time to test it out. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's the one thing we've got is a lot of time. <laughs> that's the one, the one uh, strange part is that when uh, magic went on to TV, a lot of people just televised their acts. And you remember the David Nixon show, the Paul Daniels show, standard three camera setup. there's the act, and we're watching it like that. And then Copperfield came in and he started to combine illusions and close up. And he utilized the medium of TV in a way that people hadn't seen before. So to an extent, if people want to really utilize the, the medium of Zoom or any form yeah. of interactive one-on-one uh, -on -one television, they really need to research your quirkology. <laughs> quirkology I, I think so. I think so. Well, I was thinking about this. I was having a conversation about this yesterday in that if, let's suppose, I don't know, um, people who make TV dramas and the whole system closed down. For some reason, they can't make a TV drama. If they went, okay, we're just going to put it on stage. You'd go, no, 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 it's a different skill set. Yeah. But making a TV drama is different. You can't just put it on stage. It's an entirely different process. So if you've got a live act, I don't think you can just put it straight onto to TV or just film it. It's a different beast with, with a different lexicon and a different rules. And I think what's going to happen, magicians are very, very enterprising. I think they're going to make the most of this and play with it and, and new things will come out of the form and some of them will be a bit like ecology and I hope most of them will be better. So I, I you know, magicians are a pretty enterprising lot and, and it may be this ends up actually being quite good for the art in terms of, of innovation. Well, this is this positive thinking that's another part of your psychology, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I, I, so I did scepticism for a long time about paranormally stuff and all that stuff is out there, ghosts and so on. And uh, then I pitched a book uh, all about scepticism. No one wants to buy the book and, and no publisher wanted to buy the book. And then I went to a sales conference. I was giving a talk at a sales conference and the, somebody won an award and I was on the table with this person and I said, what's the secret to selling? And they said, find something everybody wants to buy. And I, and I, <laughs> I kind of liked that. And I thought nobody wants to buy scepticism except for a few skeptics and magicians. Yeah. Um, but you can still get the idea of science in there if, if you're talking about, well, how do you make people happier, for example, or more productive or whatever. There's a lot of science to be done, a lot of experiments to be done, and people are interested in that stuff. So that became a vehicle for me for science, but everybody wants to buy it. And so I went home and I wrote a book called The Luck Factor, which is about how to get lucky based on a sort of decade of research with lucky and unlucky people. And that became a, a quite a big seller. And so I've done several of those books, which is all about the science of self-help. And as you say, positivity, which right now <laughs> turns out to be quite an important topic. Is 59 seconds that same sort of feel? Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's reviewing at uh, that time all the research about the... the so that came from a conversation. Um, I went out for a coffee with a friend of mine and she's a very successful CEO. She said, you know about happiness. How do I become happy? I'm not very happy. And I'm talking to her about the theory. She's looking bored and she says, look, can you just cut it down a bit? I said, how long have you got? She said, a minute. And I thought, you know what? I think there's a lot of people with a minute. They only want, they just want to know what's, what's the answer. And so I wrote a pitch to book called 60 Seconds and they was going to get published. They, they bought it and I'd written it. And then I went to a school show, uh, to about psychology at school. And ah, there was an annoying kid in the front row, really annoying. And I, he said, what's your next project? I said, a book called 60 Seconds, Things You Can Learn in Less Than a Minute. And he said, it should be called 59 Seconds if it's less than a minute. I thought that is a brilliant title. Uh, annoying Child, um, that's a genius idea. So I paid him absolutely nothing. And, uh, and then the book's called 59 Seconds. So yeah, things you can learn in less than a minute. 
Wow. And, and how, can we, how can we take these approaches to the situation we're in with coronavirus? I mean, there's two different schools of thought. There's the, the skeptical thinking brain that's going, what are all these crazy conspiracy theories about what's really going on? And then there's the 59 seconds type brain that's saying, yeah. we can make the most of that. We're going to turn this around. We're going to, you know, look yeah. at the silver lining. Yeah. So the, the, the conspiracy thing doesn't interest me particularly. I, I think it's, it's terrible. We had some 5G masts burned down um, here because apparently 5G is a crazy. And it turns out that the emergency services in that area were using that mast to, you know, it's just madness. Just stop it, people. Um, that's, that's just crazy. In, in terms of um, the positivity, I mean, A, we have to acknowledge a lot of people are going through a very tough time, particularly in the entertainment industry and, and obviously lots of my friends are performers and so on. It's, it's tough. I think it's focusing on what you can do. I mean, the, the, the fact is so much of this is out of our control. Uh, and, and so, you know, what, what can, can you do? And part of that, for most people, actually be solving very straightforward problems of our income and, and, and so on. I totally get that. And, and that's just straight problem solving. Once that's down and, and you, you've, you've got some semblance of, of being able to, to survive, then it becomes about how do you make the most of this? And in fact, actually, what you're seeing, I go speak for the UK, UK there's a lot of positivity around, you know, within our volunteers, here's a million people were recruited um, to volunteer to help the country. Um, there's a, a, a guy here, a, an ex uh, a sort of pensioner who's an ex-army person walking up and down to raise money for the NHS. They've, they've raised 16 million pounds. You know, it, it's phenomenal. And I think the creativity is often driven by restriction. The, the worst creativity meetings I've ever been in are the kind of advertising marketing types where they go, we've got an unlimited budget and no one can have a good idea. Yeah. People only have good ideas when you go, we've only got 50p to spend on it or we've trying to, you know. Uh, so I think the constraints um, mean that we, we will be more creative. Magicians are a very enterprising, ingenious lot. It will take time for things just to settle down to get the new normal. I think we're in this for a long time. And, and so, you know, we, we need to get used to this rather than seeing a short term strategy of hoping it's going to go away. I, I suspect it's not. So we just need to find new ways of, of being and new ways of, of doing magic. But, you know, it, it, I, I have hope. I have hope. I like that positivity. It's, it's hard because a lot of time the news tends to go for the more uh, negative stories and the more, oh, look at this disaster. And people sort of then start to turn on the news and say it's just fueling the fear. And then they don't trust yep. it. That's right. That's right. I mean, Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers in the US, uh, had this wonderful phrase, which is whenever there was um, a, something horrible on the news, like a terrorist attack or a disaster, whatever, he would always say, look for the helpers look for the people that are actually giving their, their time to make this a better situation and make them your role models. So in all those clips of the, the terribleness, there are people that are stepping forward to try and make things better. And, and that's what gives me hope, I think. Mm, absolutely. Now, there's a, another project you have coming up at the moment. It's just started. Uh, it's one of the more intriguing... I mean, you've done a lot of interesting work. You, you've, uh, you've worked on uh, Neil Gaiman's opera, Coraline which sounded like an amazing project. I, I would love to see that one day. Uh, right, yeah. So many different things. But uh, this one is an interactive online comic book. It is. Not only, yeah, not only online. It's, it's a physical comic book as well. It's here. Oh, you have one there. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew the chances? How, how can we get one in this digital age? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's called Hocus Pocus. Uh, and it's with uh, uh, Jordan uh, Culver and Rick Worth, who uh, are two uh, comic book writer and comic book illustrator. And I've worked with them before on another project. I said, how about we do a comic um, that actually tries to get magic history. I'm a huge fan of magic history. Magic history into younger minds, and in fact out there a little bit more. And so we did a, a one sort of a piece about um, Victorian mind reader and Alexander, the, the, the man who knows, who's actually looking at me right now on the poster. Um, 
And then I realized that, I mean, it's a beautiful comic. It, it, it is really great. They've done sort of amazing job uh, with the illustration and so on. And then to make it interactive, we built various uh, sort of forces and so on into it. And then I realized it could be a magic prop. So in addition, there are three tricks that only magicians know about when they buy it, um, which allows you, so there's a mishmash card on the back here, uh, allows you to perform and forces and, and so on with it. So it's the first issue. Uh, there's going to be several of them. Uh, it's available free online, or we can order a, a print copy. Uh, but it's been lots of fun. I have never worked on a comic book before, so learning a lot about how to, to write and structure comic books. Now you mentioned uh, the old Victorian era things. The seances are another fascinating part. I saw the seance you did at Magic Live. <laughs> yeah, we just did it again at Blackpool. Um, yeah, wow. That was um, terrifying. So I've, I've done seances a long time. Um, so I saw Eugene Berger lecture in 88 and he got a copy, one copy of Spirit Theatre, which is still the greatest book on this. If you want to do seance stuff, get that book. So I bought that. And then I think a year later, I bumped into Andy Nyman, uh, who was, it was a little known actor at the time. Now he's the very well known actor. But uh, Andy was interested in seances as well, and we did some seance shows together, which were great. And then I took the dark portion of that, because some of it was in light, some of it was in dark, and developed it over the, the years. And then I was talking to Stan. He said, have you got anything for Magic Live? And I said, there's a show we did once at one science festival, which is you take a small group of people out of a large group, put them into the seance room in total darkness, a feed out an infrared feed, so the big group can see the method and the small group are getting the effect. Yeah. And then you bring the small group back out and they tell us how it was, but we saw the method. Stan loves it. Yeah. And so it's a bit like powers of darkness, but for, Ooh. you know, 500 people. So uh, because there's a lot of tech, there's earpieces, um, there's, there's infrared feeds. I'm with the big group and I'm getting information from people who are in the small group and feeding it to the medium via an earpiece. It's all this tech. We've never really done it before properly. We're doing it at Magic Live in front of three groups of 500 magicians. You know what they're like as an audience. So um, it was terrifying, but it, it worked really well. We got amazing feedback on it. I think magicians just enjoyed the fact it was so different. And then we did it at Blackpool and, and again, it went very well. So yeah, yeah, kudos to all the tech people, but it was a fun show. It's like a perfect festival show. Yeah, yeah. It's so funny to see people being scared in the dark and also to have information. So the Magic Live, I don't know which show you saw, but at one point I said, anybody know anyone in the seance room? And this guy put his hand up. And I said, who is it? He says, my wife. I said, what does she do? It performs linking rings. Um, I said, is she any good? He goes, well, not so much. And so I, I feed that through to the medium. And the medium goes, well, I get an impression metal, something to do with metal. And she said, I perform linking rings. He goes, the spirits are telling me a bit more practice wouldn't go amiss. And she's like really affronted. <laughs> So it's working on all these different levels. Um, so it's great, yeah. It was fantastic, absolutely fantastic. And the other show you, you've done that I've, I've heard about but never seen was, uh, I think it was called Experimental. Experimental. I, um, so then we did that at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. And uh, it, was, it was one of those ones which it's an idea and you think, yeah, that'll work. And then about three months later, you go, oh, this is much, much harder than I thought. And so the idea was, so, so one basic method in creativity is just take away something, take away the key thing. Mm. So that's, that's what's happening now with the virus and audiences. We're taking away live audiences. Yeah. Um, uh, what I thought at the time was not that, but was to take away the performer. when you take away the performer. How have you got a show? Well, you've still got a screen. You've still got them having objects. You've got instructions and videos. They can stand up and they can go down the front. 
Um, and so the show is called Experimental. It takes the audience through several psychological experiments, but there's no presenter. And I was so scared the first time we did it. I just thought 40 minutes and there's no one on stage. Terrifying, but it, it works as a concept. We've been playing around with it. So my favorite bit is the start of the show. Uh, it just comes up on the screen. There are two buttons on, the music's playing. There are two buttons on stage, a red one and a, uh, I know it's blue and yellow, a blue one and a yellow one. One of them starts the show. The other one aborts the show. We need someone to come up and press a button. And it just sits there and hangs. And the first time we did it, the audience are just looking for about like a minute. And eventually a man stands up and he gets a big cheer, goes up onto the stage, looks at the buttons, the audience are shouting, yellow, blue. He hits the yellow one and the whole show just aborts. It just, <laughs> it just goes into black. <laughs> Screen goes, sound goes, Whoa. And they're just sitting there in silence. And then he suddenly shouts out, press the blue one. And he hit the blue one, the whole show comes up again and starts. You so were designed to start it again. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> that's it. You could have just left him there. That was it. Bad yes. choice. You're bad choice. You have to go home now. <laughs> no refunds. Um, so, yeah, so it's using just a different form of interaction. Again, it's the creativity of what happens when you take something away. You know, what, 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 can, what, what can you do with that? So it's, it's a nightmare show because you realize how much performers do in terms of controlling an audience and pace and there's a problem dealing with it. You can't do any of that. If a problem comes up, the audience has got to deal with it. We never, ever go on stage, no matter what happens. It reminds me uh, of a story from years and years ago, a guy called Jeff Crozier. I'm not sure if you've heard of him. He was a, a bit of a legend in Australian magic uh, in the 70s. Uh, he, he was doing a show in a small independent theater and he started the show with the zombie ball it's doing very mysterious and the smoke and haze and everything like this and he's got the whole uh sort of hippie style music going and he's got the ball floating and then the ball fell off and he went ladies and gentlemen the magic has ended <laughs> the show and left. <laughs> there's a um commitment uh, they're fantastic <laughs> i'm trying to think um I guess trying to be surname, a uh, comedian in his country, very experienced, Simon. Ah, oh, it's annoying me. It'll come back to me. Anyway, very well known Edinburgh fringe comedian. Um, and um, uh, Simon Munnery. And Simon's doing this show, apparently. This is Edinburgh fringe legend. And it's not going particularly well. So he says to the audience, I just need to go and get a prop. And he walks, <laughs> he just leaves. So the audience is sitting there. And apparently they sat there for 15 minutes waiting for him to go. <laughs> He's just gone. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, all these, all these possibly apocryphal stories. Oh. Anyway, that was experimental, so it was fun. Wow, it sounds amazing. So I guess the final question is, uh, where to now? I'm, you're being optimistic. You're thinking things will change. We'll be able to find, find a new way to do it. But what about you? Uh, obviously, all the projects you're working on have either stalled, disappeared, or... Going to have to be changed. Well, some of them have. Uh, I'm working on another book, which is a magic book. Um, and if it all works out, it will be really quite a significant magic book. So I'm very, very excited about that. That has stalled in terms of publication date for, for obvious reasons, but that will happen uh, sometime uh, fairly soon. Uh, I'm still doing more issues of the um, uh, Hocus Pocus stuff. And uh, so right now, as of like today, uh, I'm working with a video game designer and we're doing a video, online video game, uh, a, a computer game, I should call it, not video game, I suppose it was a computer game, uh, online computer game, on social distancing for kids. <laughs> that, that, it's lucky you were doing that. That's worked out well. Who knew? <laughs> it's the ultimate prediction. I've been working on it for three years. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so, yeah, we put it together as quickly as we can and it encourages kids to just go out, collect groceries, but keep social distance and all the players are coming towards, then joggers coming towards you and cyclists, that's even faster and so on. So, you know, there, there is opportunity out there once you've got the basics kind of sorted and, you know, we, we will get through it. It's, it's just an astonishing, astonishing time, I think, to live through. It is. And I, I think the other thing is, 
as terrifying as this is to many people, and sadly, a lot of people are, are very depressed and, and uh, not, not being able to handle it well, it is an exciting change, time of change if you look at it in a different way. I, I you know, it's a bit like the, the meteorite hitting the earth, isn't it? And, and taking out the dinosaurs. Some, some of the, the, the um, Cause not, not so good for the dinosaurs, but you know. Not so good for the dinosaurs. No, that's right. It depends how you see that story, I guess. But what is, I think, being shown is some of the smaller organizations um, are showing great agility. Yeah. The ones that can move quickly. Um, and that's true of magicians. You know, they're, they're, that's what they're legendary good at. Whatever comes along, they find a way of evolving and adapting to it. Um, some of the larger organizations, they just can't do that. You know, they've just got two bigger bills to pay and, and that's going to be tricky. So I think whatever emerges, assuming this does go on for a while, I hope it doesn't, but assuming it does, whatever emerges will be a, a different world. And as you say, you know, obviously there are people struggling and there's a great deal of uncertainty and nothing feeds anxiety like uncertainty. So, you know, all that's going on and an enormous sympathy for, for folks going through that. Um, what may emerge is a, as a, is a different world and, and it, it may play to the benefits of, of magicians. It's just very early to say, but my goodness, what a time to live through. It is amazing. Well, thank you so much for giving your time to have a chat with us all now. And I hope people feel better after that. And if they don't, they should go to 59 seconds and they will. <laughs> I hope so. And yeah, and obviously stay safe. And uh, yeah, we will all, we'll see each other and hug one another um, at some point. In, in, yeah, we'll, we will get back to some kind of new normal. Well, thank you so much for your time. See you later. Pleasure. Bye-bye. Center of the spiral. Don't take your eyes off the center of the spiral. Keep on staring at the spiral. Keep staring at the center of the spiral. And now look at the back of your hand. <laughs> 